Hi, everyone. Welcome to Germanische Heiltunde Made Easy or Germanic New Medicine Made Easy. I am Andy Lackmeers, and I'm bringing you a podcast on microbes. And so I am sitting out amongst the microbes in my backyard, which is a kind of a wild hill behind my house. So I've had a number of students ask me different questions about microbes. So I kind of put them all together and I'm going to try to address all of them. First, I want to share my disclaimer in that I am not a microbiologist. So what I do think, though, is that once we understand Gamanesh Heilkunde, we're able to look at other sciences and data, scientific data, and extrapolate different um, hypotheses or knowledge from them because of our understanding of Gamanesh. I don't know if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. But I, I encourage all of you to learn how to be a detective because we all need to be exploring all these questions that people ask and looking at them from a GHK lens. So let's see. The questions are, do TB bacteria really exist or is it just a process like a tuberculosis process? And that truly is a question that only someone from Germanische Heilkunde could ask. And I'll explain why in a minute. Another question is, are they really dormant in the conflict active phase? Because that is what we are taught. And lastly, a student asked, what is the mechanism of cell loss in the conflict active phase of new brain biological programs? They have cell loss. How do we lose those cells? Is it from microbes or not? All right, so... Again, I'm not a microbiologist, but here's what I'm, I'm going to give you a little thumbnail version of what I think the answers are in all the research that I did and the people that I also spoke with about this. So in, in 2016, there was a new estimate on the number of microbes that we have. And they were saying that they think that there's a trillion species of microbes on this planet. And we don't know 99.999% of them. So what do microbiologists do? Oh, well, I think it's kind of amazing that we might have a trillion species. And they're saying that a human microbiome, what we have inside us, is anywhere from 39 trillion cells to 100 trillion cells. And so inside us, our microbiome, right, we all have bacteria, viruses, of course, they don't exist. But when you're looking at allopathic information, you're going to see viruses. So I'm going to change that. We have bacteria and fungus inside us. We know we have fungi. And so that's our human biome. And that's, you know, 39 trillion cells. One place said 100 trillion cells. So I don't really think they know. And I think that's the big part of a lot of this is that they don't really know. I think Dr. Hammer's information, though, really opened up the whole world of microbes to another whole level of understanding. Okay, so I'm going to show you some charts of what we're talking about of all of life on this planet is put into three buckets and that's it we have three buckets of life yeah i literally have paper charts i've printed out and so here we have um, bacteria archaea and eukaryotes, eukaryota, eukaryotes. So we are eukaryotes. This is fungus and animals and plants. And that's, you see the, the common branch here. And then it branches out. We've got the bacteria over here. And then it branches up this way. The archaea are here. And then the eukaryotes are here. That's one way of looking at it. These are prokaryotes. And these are eukaryotes. So prokaryote means that they're single cell organisms and they don't have a nuclei. Pretty basic. Whereas the eukaryotes, that's us and fungi, we have a nuclei. And that nuclei has the DNA encapsulated in it that separates it from the rest of the cell. So that's the difference between all of life on this planet is what's your nuclei if you even have one. Here's the same picture a little bit differently. And then here's yet another one. You can see how they all look a little bit different.
Okay, so that's just to give you a little background. Now, about 40 to 50 years ago, scientists were saying that we have more microbes than cells. They outnumber 10 to 1. And now the scientists are in the past five years or so, it's like, nah, it's probably more like one to one. That the amount of cells we have is fairly equal to the amount of microbes. I mean, do we really know? That's what they're saying now. Just know that microbes, um, you cannot see them with the naked eye. So you have to use a microscope. They are either spherical or rod shaped or they're spiral. They can be um, curved as well and lobed. So they can be a little bit different. And I also want to bring in information that sometimes you'll see translated from German into English, the term fungal bacteria. What is that? Because when we look at these charts, we are not seeing fungal bacteria. We have fungi over here, and then we have bacteria over here, and the twain are not meeting. So what is fungal bacteria? Well, know that there is a lot of cross play here. All right. So when we see fungal bacteria, what that means is that we have a fungus and bacteria has burrowed itself inside, and now there's a symbiotic relationship between the two of them. Kind of cool. So the, the um, bacteria get a place to live, and the fungi get some benefits from having the bacteria inside them as well. And this is a lot of life, is making up these symbiotic relationships. It's not just out there in the fungus and the bacteria, it's inside us as well. Okay, so let's look at the mycobacteria because that's our term, right? Our GHK term, the mycobacteria. What the heck is that? And so Dr. Hummer describes it as like the TB, right? Let's look at what is mycobacteria. We're going to look at our charts again. Well, so remember, we've got the three categories here. The mycobacteria are gram-positive bacteria. Now, they're not fungi. They're bacteria. They're gram-positive bacteria over here. That's one way to look at it. Okay, so looking at another chart. So think of the um, taxonomy. In other words, the hierarchy. We have the genus, we have the phylum, and then we have the genus underneath that. And so mycobacteria are kind of nestled. And so looking at this chart here, we've got the, the bacteria over here in red. They call it eubacteria. And you see the actino, actinobacteria are right here. Under the actinobacteria are the mycobacterias. Under the mycobacterias, there's about 188 different kinds. So we're not talking like this is a huge prevalent thing here. This is a tiny piece of a tiny piece. And on this picture, we have the gram-negative bacteria here. We've got gram-positives here. And here's the actinobacteria right here. Underneath that is the mycobacteria. So we're talking about such a minute amount of bacteria here. When in our world, it's like, oh, the mycobacteria, they, we're, they're flourishing. And, and they, I'm sure they are. But when we look at the, the whole of what we're talking about of life on this planet, it's like, Wow, that's a really small subspecies. So let's see, we have two super popular mycobacteriums that we use regularly, right? And of course, we, the number one is the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis that's used in the death rite programs, the lung alveoli, cell growth in the conflict active phase. We break it down with the mycobacterium tuberculosis. We also have the mycobacterium leprae or leporomitosis, and that is used in the corium program, the dermis, right? That would be, a, of course, cell growth in the conflict active phase. And then again, we break it down with these very, very specific mycobacteria. So the, answering the question, do bacteria actually exist? Absolutely. And you can see them under a microscope. So TB actually exists, and we know there's about 188 different types of mycobacteria. So they're all cousins under the umbrella of actinobacteria, which is under the gram-positive on the bacteria chart, all the layers, right? So looking at, is this a process? Well, yeah, I mean, you could say it's a process. It's, it's definitely a noun. It's definitely a bacteria. And so, and that we can see in the microscope. But when we look at the word tuberculosis, that's, of course, oh, it's a disease. He's got TB. 
And that is a tubercle is a skin lesion. And that's what you see in tuberculosis. The word tubercular would be an adjective like, oh, he's a tubercular patient. Um, the word tuberculously, that does not exist, right? So, oh, this is being broken down tuberculously. That's not a real word. But, you know, we know GHK, we, we can make sense of that, right? That, okay, it's being brought, broken down from TB bacteria that's, you know, causing the necrosis to happen. So it's not really a, um, a word, but we, we can make sense of it at least. So, so yes, it is a real thing and TB are real. TB bacterium, mycobacteriums are real. And, you know, the word is also used as a process accurately or not. It, it's not entirely accurate, but we, it makes sense. I did ask a couple of medical personnel, hey, do you ever use the word tuberculously or tubercular? And they're like, ah, no, not for probably decades, you know, 100 years. So it doesn't seem to be something super common in today's hospitals for whatever that's worth. So the next question was, are they really dormant in the conflict active phase? And so what are they really doing? If our mycobacteria are multiplying, right, in the conflict active phase, or if it's a regular bacteria, your strep or staph, that it's just going about doing what it does. Well, what do bacteria do? Bacteria do a heck of a lot more than what we think of in the two phases. And that's what I think is important to understand. So our support system, what used to be called the immune system, our whole support system is based on the, the work of bacteria. So it's really important for us Bacteria make our GI tract, uh, our digestion easier, helps everything to, to be broken down and absorbed better. Bacteria provide a checks and balances for many of the organ systems in our body. Bacteria also create nutrients and vitamins. So there's a lot of things bacteria do that can really help us to stay in, in that eutonia, that normatonia or homeostasis. And so if they're dormant in the conflict active phase, are they still doing all these things? I mean, I don't know, but I would guess that they are, right? Especially the regular bacteria that they're not multiplying at all in the conflict active phase. They're simply there doing all the things that bacteria do. This is what they do. They help us to keep our checks and balances in place. So I think they're very busy. And then we have a very small few subspecies here that in the conflict active phase in the endoderm programs, they're multiplying. So we have exactly the number that we need to break down that endoderm tumor that grew. So are they dormant? I don't think they're dormant. When you look at what's going on in the body, there are so many things that bacteria do every single second. So I'm not sure that they're absolutely dormant there. Okay, so the next question was, what is the mechanism of cell loss in the conflict active phase of new brain biological programs? So new brain, cerebral medulla, new brain mesoderm, and also the cerebral cortex, right, that have cell loss in the conflict active phase. Um, how, how do we create that cell loss? Where did these cells go? What's going on with them? So this was really interesting to explore because I looked in all the English sources that I have, and I also looked in some German sources and I found nothing. I talked with some folks who knew Dr. Hammer. They never heard him say anything about this, they said. Interesting. I don't know that this was ever taught. I'm just going to give you a, some educated guesses here. So there's several ways that we commonly have cell death or that we get rid of cells. Apoptosis is probably the most common way. When our cells are no longer needed, then they sort of commit suicide by an internal structure, an intracellular death program that's just programmed into every cell. And what happens is that it releases enzymes that are held in every cell that are designed to break that cell down. And this is a programmed cell death, apoptosis. We have billions of cells that die in our bone marrow and our intestine every hour by apoptosis. This is not unusual, folks. We do this all the time, many, many times over, all the time, literally. And so in humans, in adult humans, the cell death balances the cell division, you know, the cell growth. 
So there's always that that balance going on that we're always striving for, right? Now, the other way that we can lose cells is through necrosis. Now, we see that word a lot in GHK. There's necrotic things happening, necrosis. And that's that gets a little dicier. Um, there's many different ways of necrosis occurs. Injury is one of them. The cells will s- swell and burst and literally kind of splatter their neighbor cells with their guts. And that's necrosis. And the thing that's different with necrosis ver- versus apoptosis is that necrosis has inflammation. So when do we see inflammation? Right, we see that in the PCL phase. So that inflammatory response we see in cell necrosis, that is PCL, which I think is fascinating. And by by contrast, the cell that does the apoptosis, it dies very neatly and it doesn't damage its neighbors. That kind of sounds like cell loss in the conflict active phase versus cell necrosis. Cell breakdown of endoderm programs is kind of like inflammation. It's a mess, splatter, splatter. We're getting rid of the remnants. So this is how I'm looking at this, that the, that the apoptosis that occurs is the cell loss, that something is triggering the cell loss in the conflict active phase, and it's very neat and tidy. There's no inflammation in there. That sounds a lot like the apoptosis versus this nest cell necrosis, which is splat inflammation, and that sounds like your cell breakdown of endoderm programs in the PCL phase. So the third option that was given to me by someone who worked with Dr. Hammer was a- an idea, and that is that perhaps the nutrition, nutrition to the cells decreases in the conflict active phase of new brain programs, and then those cells then dehydrate and just kind of shrivel up. Maybe don't die. Where are they going? We don't find remnants of them that we know of, right? Not like we find remnants of like the lung program that's being broken down, the lung tumors or the glandular breast tumors that are broken down. We see remnants of that. We don't see remnants of the cell loss in the conflict active phase. So do they just dehydrate and kind of deflate? This person said maybe they're just deflating. So um, they're going to do a little more research and see if they can find something out. But it was an in- interesting thought, and this person did not indicate that Dr. Homer talked about this. So kind of fascinating there. Okay, so I hope this has been helpful information for you and hope I got your brain thinking about microbes. Go on out and enjoy some microbes in your environment. And if you can like this, follow it, share it, do all those social media things that that you do, I really would appreciate that. Just to get the word out there about Germanische Heilkunde. Day. Thank you very much for being here. And I hope to see you soon. Let me know what you'd like me to talk about in future podcasts. I really appreciate that. Take care.